So I want to talk about uh, the intersection between uh, uh, neuroscience and, 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 and cognitive science and, and artificial intelligence. Um, so the, um, the general uh, theme uh, will be about um, how uh, understanding brains can help us uh, inspire building uh, better computational models. And, and by computational models, I, I, I'm really thinking about trying to understand how the brain works. Uh, but at the same time, the flip side of that is that those computational models can actually serve useful purposes in the world. They can really be algorithms uh, for uh, object recognition, for, for, for language, uh, for, for different types of uh, uh, applications. So, so the idea of building AI, uh, I think, is intrinsically related to, to the notion of computational neuroscience and building computational models of uh, uh, brain function. And in turn, and I, I, I want have a lot to say about that, uh, but that, that's of course also uh, very dear to my heart and, and to many of us uh, here. Uh, the, the reverse direction where we can use some of those uh, computational models and, and AI algorithms to actually uh, better understand uh, aspects of uh, neuroscience and, and, and brain function. There has been tremendous progress, I would say, in, in that direction, in, in using ideas from AI uh, to better understand uh, neuroscience. It's a little bit less obvious uh, where to draw inspiration from neuroscience. We're uh, bombarded with uh, enormous amounts of uh, data. And, 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 and the difficult question is what, what to extract from all of those data. What's interesting, what's not, what's important, what's not in terms of um, building uh, new uh, computational models. Tommy uh, already alluded to the notion that there are Possible, there are possibly many types of intelligent, perhaps infinite uh, different ways of building uh, intelligent uh, systems. Uh, I am particularly interested in, in biological intelligence for, for a number of reasons that I will uh, articulate. Uh, but, but I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, building uh, uh, AI and computer science that is completely orthogonal and independent of, of, of brain function. I think that that's a very laudable goal as well. Uh, and, and there's no shortage of, of people in this world that, that, that build algorithms uh, that are not really connected to, uh, uh, to, to brains. I, I do think that there is uh, uh, that the intersection between uh, uh, brains and, and computer science and, and neuroscience and AI is, is, is very interesting for, for several reasons. One of them, I think, is just uh, curiosity. I, I think understanding how, how brains works, uh, how brains work, and how different animal species uh, uh, work is uh, arguably the, the most exciting challenge uh, in, in, in the world, in the universe. It's, it's the most important question of all time. I think understanding circuits of neurons uh, and, and how they uh, uh, emerge in computations uh, um, uh, happen uh, is, is harder than understanding quantum mechanics. It's harder than understanding the, the most challenging scientific questions of all, of all time. So uh, just uh, sheer curiosity, uh, uh, I think that... Uh, uh, all of us should be interested in, in understanding uh, brains. Uh, another reason why I think it's interesting to, to study uh, biology and real brains is that uh, many of us are also interested in eventually fixing brains. Uh, mental health uh, conditions are arguably among the most devastating diseases uh, in, in, in the world, uh, both in terms of their uh, economical uh, and, uh, cost as well as in terms of the uh, social uh, and societal uh, consequences. Uh, to some extent, I think I'm not exaggerating when I say that uh, almost any problem that you can think of uh, from uh, world peace to, to, to wars to, to politics, ultimately all of that is, is, is inside here. It's in our brains. So, so understanding brains, I think, uh, will have a tremendous impact uh, in almost every aspect of, um, uh, of, of our lives. So uh, curiosity, uh, fixing brains, uh, potentially augmenting cognition. Uh, augmenting cognition is now um, still kind of uh, in the realm of science fiction, uh, but I suspect that it will happen. We will be able to go inside brains and, and actually uh, uh, manipulate uh, cortical function to, to do quite uh, amazing uh, things. There are lots of interesting ethical questions about that. Uh, but also lots of fascinating scientific questions uh, uh, about that. So this is what, what Tommy was alluding to when he said, well, what, if we want to build brain-machine interfaces, uh, we need to understand uh, brains. But what I'm mostly going to talk about today is the, 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 the other reason, which is that I believe that understanding computations in, in, in the brain can also help us build um, better, more robust, uh, uh, more um, uh, AI that can, uh, that can generalize uh, better. And that, that's going to be the main uh, the main theme uh, today. 
So the, the plan is uh, to divide this into two parts until noon. The first one, I want to give you uh, uh, a couple of examples of the interactions between neuroscience and, and, and AI. Uh, I have three examples that I have uh, picked to discuss with you today. Uh, I'm happy to go off script. And, and again, uh, uh, you, you, you should be running the show. And, and I'm happy to take this in, 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 in different directions. And then the second part, uh, we will have a short break. And then the second part, it's, it's really a collection of uh, random thoughts and, and prov provocative conjectures, uh, mostly to stimulate uh, discussion. I, uh, I, I have a couple of slides uh, that are really aimed to, um, uh, to, to, to be provocative and, and, and claims that uh, I hope many of you will disagree with and, 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 and will have interesting discussions uh, today and, and, and in the days uh, to come. There are three main examples that, that, that I, I plan to uh, um, uh, briefly uh, allude to uh, today, and, and these have to do with um, these have to do with uh, trying to understand uh, what happens uh, after the, the regime that many of us think of as uh, immediate vision. So, uh, what uh, I, uh, we have been working on, and Jim has been working on, and many people have been working on, is what happens when you flash an image and you try to recognize that image. So we mostly think about what happens in the initial, uh, let's say, one, 200 milliseconds after flashing an image. Uh, and that's, in a sense, what a lot of the computational models of vision have been uh, uh, focusing on. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about what happens after that, what happens after this uh, initial wave of activity that's important for, for visual recognition. And, and there are three examples that I want to discuss. One is the problem of pattern completion. Uh, and, and generally uh, uh, recognizing uh, uh, objects in, in sort of more challenging uh, conditions. Uh, the second one is uh, uh, give you a brief introduction to uh, eye movements and, and what happens when you move your eyes from, from one place to another, how, how, how can we understand those, uh, those eye movements. Uh, and, and finally, uh, about uh, what I call uh, uh, contextual uh, uh, reasoning and, and not just understanding uh, an object in isolation, but how an object actually relates to the uh, to the surrounding uh, uh, scene. There are many other topics that I could, could have discussed. Uh, information after 150, 200 milliseconds uh, uh, also goes into the memory system. I'm happy to talk more about uh, uh, memory, how we form memories from that information. Uh, uh, there's a very strong adaptation. Uh, signals uh, change dramatically over time uh, uh, after, uh, after this initial uh, wave of uh, of activity, uh, we're also constantly making predictions about what's going to, uh, to, to happen next. And these are some uh, example work that we've done in some of these other areas, but I was uh, planning to skip this unless people um, want to ask and, and have questions. Okay, so the first uh, topic uh, that I want to talk about is uh, pattern completion and recognition of uh, heavily occluded uh, uh, objects. Um, in general, I'll, I'll try to put pictures of the people that have done the work. Some of you may recognize uh, Martin is here. He was in, in our lab a long time ago, and he was one of the pioneers in this uh, line of work together with uh, two talented uh, grad students. And I'm not sure if these things work, but if, uh, if you scan them, I think you should be able to go to uh, download all the data uh, as well as uh, papers related to what I'm uh, talking about. Under normal viewing conditions in the, in, in the natural world, we often encounter objects that are, uh, that are heavily occluded. Uh, so for example, right now, there I know that there's a seat right there, even though uh, uh, I, I only can see uh, a very small uh, fraction uh, of, that, uh, of, that, uh, of that seat. So this is, this is, this is typical, and, and if you pay attention to, to what you're looking around, uh, it, it's, 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 uh, uh, it's ubiquitous. So uh, everywhere, uh, there, there's partial information uh, due to uh, occlusion. There's also uh, uh, partial information due to other uh, issues like poor illumination, shadows, and, and so on and so forth. But, but occlusion is particularly uh, prominent uh, in, in the context of vision. So this is one example of the um, famous uh, Piazza San Marco in, in Venice, uh, in Italy, in, a, uh, uh, in one of those uh, days when uh, everything's really flooded. Uh, and, um, and, and you can see that, uh, for example, here, uh, you can probably just see a handful of pixels there, uh, and, and yet I guess uh, uh, most of you can infer that that's, uh, that that's a table. Uh, you can probably see very few pixels uh, of, of, of this uh, um, a person here. Uh, you can barely see the, 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 this chair here. So despite the fact that there's uh, almost minimal information about, uh, about those objects, we can still recognize them uh, uh, quite well. Part of why we can recognize these objects has to do with context, and I'll come back to context at the end. 
But even with those isolated objects, I contend that you can still recognize them quite well from partial information. Uh, and I would argue that this is a pretty challenging problem for uh, a lot of current uh, AI uh, algorithms. I would argue that uh, uh, animals in general can uh, do something quite interesting in terms of pattern completion. And I'll give you a hint about potential mechanisms of uh, how that uh, may happen. So we, we did a series of uh, very simple experiments in object recognition. We present an object uh, and, and we ask people uh, to recognize uh, what that object is. In this particular case, they were doing five-way categorization. There were five different object categories. When the objects are fully visible, the whole objects here, this is a trivial task. It's very, very easy. And then we use a technique called bubbles to uh, partially occlude those objects. So this is basically looking at the world like this with, 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 with a bubble that reveals part of the object. Um, so if there are lots of bubbles, the, uh, uh, the object is, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, information. It's very easy. If there are very, very few bubbles, uh, the problem becomes harder and harder. So we can titrate the difficulty of the, of the task. We can also uh, uh, control for how long we present those, those, those images, uh, here from 25 to 150 milliseconds. And then at the end, subjects have to do a, a forced choice five-way uh, uh, categorization. So this is uh, uh, behavioral data uh, from uh, human subjects uh, performing this task. So what you see on the x-axis is the percentage of uh, visibility. So when it's 100%, that means uh, that you're seeing the whole object. Again, this is a trivial task. People are essentially at ceiling. Uh, it doesn't matter basically for how long you present that image. If you present it for 25 milliseconds or 150 milliseconds, there are five points that overlap there uh, in, in, in here. Okay. Not surprisingly, as the task becomes uh, harder, uh, performance uh, uh, deteriorates. Uh, chances uh, 20%. The y-axis here is performance in this, uh, in, in this task. Uh, and one thing that's quite remarkable here is that uh, people are quite robust in, in terms of uh, object recognition, even up to, let's say, 10% visibility. So people are only seeing 10% uh, of the image. Uh, the, there's still uh, quite a bad chance in, in, in doing this uh, uh, task uh, and, and being able to do pattern completion and, and recognizing these uh, heavily crude objects. Yes. Can we pass the microphone? Uh... All right. <laughs> no, 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 you can use both. Uh, that's that, that that already on. Um, so just a quick question. And, um, and you have, is the error bars, are they um, across like different partial occlusions and across uh, subjects? Yeah, so, so the, these error bars are uh, a combination of two things. So one is different participants, this are different subjects, uh, but also uh, all the different images uh, that, that, that were shown here and also different occlusions. So, so there, there's, there's a lot of things that are combined in these uh, in, in these error bars here. So there are, there are five different categories. They're all put together in here. For each category, there are many different versions of different exemplars. For each exemplar, there are many different bubble positions. And on top of that, there are different participants. All of that is, 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 is combined in this, in, in this yeah, I was here. just wondering, because like, sometimes the line might be easier to recognize than other times. Right, you're right. So in fact, this, this technique was used uh, originally to try to discover which features are interesting and which ones are not. So there are certain features that are easier to recognize than, than others. Uh, so I, I don't have the slide here, but if you go into our paper, and even better into the previous paper using uh, bubbles, uh, there's a lot of studies about uh, specific images, specific objects, uh, which features are, you know, are more relevant for, for, for recognition, and, and, and so on. Uh, uh, all of that is sort of put together in here. Any, any yes. And, and if I, somebody can pass the microphone. kids or did maybe have like better Im imagination or like, is it what did you try it on different age groups that maybe like oh, kids age have group. This? yeah yeah so th this, this were psychophysical experiments uh, conducted in the lab so i want to say that the majority of people of subjects here are college age uh, uh, students um we, we haven't really tested these at, at, at different uh, ages uh uh, my guess is that unless you go to uh, very young kids, that, that it probably doesn't really matter too much. That, that, that but, but we haven't really done it. so that that's just yeah. my. Because idea. like I, I'm thinking that maybe like kids have better imagination and can kind of connect you to kind of crazy things that might be interesting to to see. Oh. 
Yeah, yeah, it, it, it may very well be. And, and, and again, this is a pretty simple task. You can imagine uh, more uh, complex uh, pattern completion tasks where, uh, which do depend very strongly on experience. Uh, uh, I don't know, you can talk about uh, clinicians that are doing uh, recognition of uh, tumors in images, and, and that's very strongly dependent on, on, on expertise. So pattern completion in that case depends very much on, on what people. In, in this particular case, I, I, my, my conjecture would be that, that, that it doesn't matter uh, uh, that much. I also want to say that um, what I mean by pattern completion in this case is the ability to perform this task, meaning to do five-way object uh, uh, recognition. I am not claiming here uh, that people are actually imagining uh, the whole object or doing what some people in AI called uh, uh, filling in or, uh, or in painting of the whole, uh, of the whole thing. Okay, uh, we can debate about whether people are doing that or not. All I can say here is that they're pressing the right button or not in terms of five-way categorization. Have you looked at how the performance changes when the number of categories that they can select from changes? Yeah, so, so we, we, we haven't really uh, done that uh, in, in, in here. We've done that with computational models. I'll talk about computational models in a second. But for, but for the performance for subjects, no, we haven't uh, quite, quite done that. Um, Remind me of this question later on because I, I want to talk about um, a different way of doing uh, object recognition tasks that we're uh, that we're doing now. That I'll, I'll I think I'll talk about that when I talk about context, uh, but, but not in here. But, but no, here we have not changed number of uh, categories. But no, because it's interesting because in this example it's constrained your number of options constrained. But like a clinician who has to make a decision based on a chest X-ray or an ECG, their options are similarly constrained by the prior information, like what symptoms the patient has as well. So I think this, you know that idea of constraining and how that relates to whether you can make uh, Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Uh, and, and, I, and I agree with you. I think this is important here because uh, 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 even though maybe you don't see the entire line here, uh, you know that it's not a rocket. Rocket is not one of the possible categories in this task. Uh, at least at the beginning, you don't know, but after doing the task for a while, uh, you quickly figure out. Uh, we've done this with single trials and people still perform uh, uh, basically uh, uh, more or less at the same uh, at the same level. But, but yes, you're right. All of these uh, sort of meta aspects of the task are, are, are actually important. Uh, yes. Right, so that, that, that's what I wanted to comment on at, uh, uh, later on. So, so here, this is five choices. So you, it's fourth choice. Either you press one of those five buttons or you stay in that chair until you press one. So <laughs> this is five. So uh, we have now done uh, other experiments uh, with, with Mengmi here where we actually just uh, have people type whatever they want. And I think that's an interesting and different way of doing object recognition. Uh, I'll show you some uh, data on that at the end uh, or, or later on. And, and, and I'm, I'm actually becoming more and more convinced that that's a better way of studying uh, object uh, recognition. Anyway, so since people ask, let, let me actually get into that now. Um, this is the most traditional way, I would argue, in which people have done psychophysics. This is also how we do computational models. Uh, when we do computational models, we have a fixed number of labels that we can assign to, to an object. So now we're doing other types of experiments where we ask people, what is it? And you can type a word, whatever it is. So I like that better because I think it's more natural. Uh, I think it suffers less from some of these constraints. One challenge in that is that it's harder to compare computers and, 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 and humans. So first of all, it's, it's harder to assess exactly what chance is. Uh, so if I, if I tell you, you can say whatever word uh, you want. I, I cannot draw this nice line here. Uh, and, 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 and again, it's, it's, it's harder to compare with, with machines that have a, a, a sort of a pre-specified repertoire of, of possible uh, objects. But, but I think that there are advantages to testing object recognition that way. I think it's more uh, relevant. And I think it's, it, it sort of leads to surprises and that, showing that people are not as good as, as, as we think uh, they are. Uh, of that. So I think this is an interesting sort of methodological question about how we conduct um, uh, this type of uh, visual recognition task. And I'll, I'll show some results with, with that other kind of paradigm later on. The last point about machines, you could have had a machine that generates captions for comparison. Just, uh, right, right. I, I, I would, yeah, so, so that, that, that's a good point. Uh, first of all, um, I think even with captions, there's some sort of training and some sort of constrained vocabulary. Uh, we probably have a constrained vocabulary as well, even though we don't like to think of it uh, the, that way. But, but you're right. Um, it's also hard to compare a caption with a single word. We can constrain the caption to be a single word and train algorithms to, to do that uh, as, as well. So, so yes, I think that that, that, that may be an interesting uh, way to go. 
in this spirit, it's kind of remind me that. Um, so can you make the connection? Yeah, so, so um, you're referring to this beautiful study by uh, Shimon Ullman and, and, and colleagues uh, looking at uh, what they call MERCs, uh, minimal recognizable components, image, no, but there, there's a C there. Uh, I forgot. So, so what they do, basically, they, they take an image and they start uh, cropping it uh, until uh, it becomes uh, unrecognizable. So there's, uh, what they find, which is, I think, uh, pretty, pretty interesting, is that uh, there's basically a, a point where if you crop it even by one more pixel, uh, it, it becomes almost uh, uh, unrecognizable. Whereas if you enlarge uh, by, by, by one pixel, essentially, uh, in, in all dimensions, then uh, uh, it, it, it becomes easily recognizable. There's, this is a pretty sharp transition between uh, recognition and, and, and no recognition for, uh, for for many of the images that they tested. So we, we've talked to, uh, uh, we, we, um, in fact, we have a project jointly with uh, with, with Shimon on, on, on this. Many of these images, I think, are not minimal uh, in that definition. Some of them happen to be just by, by chance, uh, basically. So we, we, we tested this uh, with, with them. Uh, but this, I think, when I say minimal information, I don't really mean minimal in, 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 the, in the sense that they, they, they do. I say there's little information here, yet uh, people can recognize it quite, quite well. But they, they really try to get at uh, what's the minimum that we need uh, for, for, for object recognition. And then for, for many objects, uh, they, they, they found this uh, pretty sharp transition between uh, uh, what's recognizable and, and, and what's not. It's not only a function of how much of the image you can see, I guess, it's also like what part of the image, because if you're only zooming on the legs of the... Uh, uh, absolutely. So, so that, that, that's why this technique was uh, basically created in the first uh, uh, place. So what I'm showing here is uh, random bubble locations and an average of all of those. But if you actually look at every single image, and, and this is related to, to the previous question as well, you're absolutely right. So there, there are parts of the image that are more informative than others. And essentially, that's what the Merck study is, is getting at, which, which are the parts of the image that, that are more recognizable or not. As, as a technical comment for the aficionados in this uh, Merck technique, they, they, they are basically constraining the image in, in, in uh, 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 basically by cropping or blurring. Uh, they, they cannot get at uh, sort of internal parts of the object that, that are minimal in, in, in a sense because of the, the, the way they are constructing those images. But you could imagine some variation of that technique where uh, you, you, you could get at this, uh, this, this kind of uh, issues. But you're absolutely right. So some features are, are, are definitely more, more relevant uh, than, than others. Yeah. The, the Shimon Ullman work was also a psychophysicist in, in MTurk, in New humans. Yes. They, they, they have, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about networks very soon, but basically the, the, uh, most of the uh, current state-of-the-art networks do not really match human performance in, in, in showing these uh, sharp transitions uh, in, 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 in visual uh, recognition. Uh. Is this symmetry, is symmetry ever taken into account in these methods? Because from the um, labels I see, most of these objects that you show are symmetric. So if you remove something on the right, you still see it on the left. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. I, I, I haven't thought too much about it. Um, I am not sure. I've seen all of these images. I, I, I don't really recall how symmetric they are or not. Sometimes they are rotated and, uh, and, and so on. Um, again, it's, it's clear that there are some features that are more important than others, and, 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 and you're right that Part of the object may, may compensate if, if the object is, is, is perfectly symmetric. Um, yeah. OK, so there's correct recognition even with about 20% uh, 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 visibility. Um, and then I want to show you one more behavioral experiment. Uh, we used the technique that's called backward masking. So this basically entails showing an object, and then very briefly after showing the, uh, the object, uh, putting uh, 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 an image that contains uh, noise. Uh, so this is, this is the mask, this is the noise. Uh, what kind of noise you use uh, does, does matter, uh, and, and we can talk more about that. In this particular case, this is a texture that's derived from uh, uh, all the objects uh, using an algorithm developed by Portilla and Simoncelli. So it's basically sort of low-level features of uh, uh, all the objects uh, combined. So it's a, it's, a, it's a particular type of noise. It works with a lot of different types of noise. It doesn't work with any, any, any kind of image. This 
technique of backward masking has been uh, used uh, uh, to try to assess, to try to interrupt visual uh, processing. And the conjecture is that you show an image, if you very quickly show this, uh, this backward mask, uh, that interrupts processing and therefore makes the system work in a largely feedforward uh, way. So mostly you're looking at how the system works in a bottom-up fashion without a lot of other uh, uh, additional processing that can take place after. Critical to backward masking is this number here, the, the amount of uh, exposure time. If the exposure time is very brief, then basically the objects become uh, uh, invisible. If the object exposure time is very, very long, then the backward mask basically does nothing. And you can see that in here, this is the performance during backward masking. And now you have to pay attention to the different colors. So this line here corresponds to 25 milliseconds. So when you present the objects for 25 milliseconds, even though they were uh, uh, recognized uh, pretty well without the backward mask, now when we introduce the backward mask, uh, performance goes almost to, uh, to charts. In contrast, when you have 150 milliseconds, uh, performance is largely uh, uh, unaffected. Performance also deteriorates uh, in the case of the, uh, uh, in the, in the, case of the uh, presentation of the full object. So we think that this uh, suggests that um, it costs about 50 milliseconds or so to be able to perform pattern completion. So this, this the ability to recognize objects that are heavily occluded is impaired by the presentation of a backward mask when the presentation uh, uh, time is short, let's say 25 or 50 milliseconds, but not beyond that. So, so whatever computations are transpiring uh, uh, in order to be able to perform uh, pattern completion uh, we think that uh, they, they require a, a, about an additional 15 milliseconds or so of processing to be able to, uh, to, to recognize objects under these more difficult conditions. So uh, I know that in the case of, say, illusory contours, there's been work showing that the brain activations are actually as if the illusory contour was present. I'm wondering in the case of this, you know, missing information, given enough time, uh, is there any work testing if the brain activations are basically similar, whether you showed missing data or complete data? You're talking about the brain? Yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll show that in the next slide. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get into the brain now. So any, any questions about the behavior? Uh, okay. Okay. So, so uh, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, we, we planted this uh, question. So perfect. Okay. So um, we wanted to look at what happens inside the brain. Jim talked a little bit about uh, uh, recordings in monkeys. I'll, I'll give you a brief introduction to uh, neurophysiological recordings inside the human brain. Uh, and, and I'm going to show you a little bit of data on what happens inside the brain uh, during recognition of these heavily occluded uh, objects. So we have collaborated with uh, uh, neurosurgeons who implant electrodes in patients with pharmacologically intractable uh, epilepsy. It's illegal to implant electrodes inside the brain in, 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 in normal humans. We tried. Uh, many of us wanted to put electrodes in our brains. No neurosurgeon is, is, is going to do that. Uh, but the way that we can do this is by going to patients that have epilepsy, where they put these electrodes for clinical reasons. They are trying to localize where the seizures are coming from in order to try to remove the part of the brain that's responsible for the seizures. Uh, and for that, they need to monitor the patients for about one week. The patients are in the hospital for about one week. So we have the opportunity to uh, uh, look inside the brain and to do uh, neurophysiological recordings uh, in human subjects that are uh, perfectly conscious and awake uh, uh, when, the, when they're performing different tasks, while we can monitor uh, activity with very high signal-to-noise ratio, uh, very high temporal resolution, and uh, somewhat adequate or high, depending on the case, uh, 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 spatial resolution uh, uh, as well. This is very different from uh, all the things that one can do from outside the brain. So this is not EEG, this is not fMRI, this is really looking inside the brain at, 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 what's, uh, at, at what's, what's happening. Depending on the type of patient, uh, uh, the neurosurgeons may use different types of electrodes. Uh, we have some electrodes that are, uh, for the aficionados, these are about one or two millimeter electrodes that have a very uh, low impedance and that allow us to record local field potential signals, uh, but not the activity of individual neurons. And then sometimes we have also worked with um, very thin microwires of about 40 microns with high impedance. Uh, of about half a mega ohm or so uh, that allow us to uh, record the activity of uh, individual neurons. Uh, so these are uh, traces of field potential signals that we can record. These are, uh, this is one particularly good recording that we had where we could uh, uh, look at the activity of uh, individual neurons. So for the uh, 
people who are not familiar with uh, uh, neuroscience data, this is uh, voltage as a function of time. And, and, and here, when you have these very sharp deflections, these are the action potentials uh, from, 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 this, uh, from these neurons. So the patients, uh, so, and, and these are, this is showing the locations of these uh, uh, large electrodes that give us field potentials. This is showing the position of one of these depth electrodes with a microwire that can uh, allow us to record the activity of uh, individual uh, neurons. A uh, couple of uh, tangential comments about this, which I find quite fascinating. Uh, these patients are there for, for, for clinical reasons. At the end of this one week, they determine which particular part of the brain is responsible for the seizures. And then at that time, or in some cases, a few months later, they actually, in the neurosurgeons, go and remove part of the brain. And in the majority of cases, this helps the patients and the patients become uh, seizure free. What I find quite shocking uh, and, uh, and, uh, is that in the majority of these cases, the vast majority of these cases, nothing happens with cognition. That is, you can take out a chunk of the brain, and, and Jeff Lichtman was sort of alluding to, uh, for those of you who stayed late, uh, he was talking about this yesterday as well. You can remove a chunk of the human brain, and absolutely nothing happens. So I think that that's, that's quite remarkable. I think that's quite amazing. Good luck taking a, a laptop and, and removing randomly, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a couple of thousand transistors and hoping that it will work, right? So the, the human brain, and this has been done also in, in, in animals as well, you can actually take out a cubic centimeter uh, of, of, of the brain and, and people function quite well. I took a class many years ago with, uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, with, with a neurosurgeon that, that was working with uh, um, Roger Sperry at Caltech who, who got a Nobel Prize. Uh, he, he, he claimed that with a few exceptions, there, there are a couple of locations which are pretty critical uh, and if you remove them, things are, uh, don't, don't look good at all. But by and large, you can go into somebody when they're sleeping with a kitchen spoon, scoop out the, car the chunk of the brain, and the person will wake up in the morning and will not turn, uh, uh, may become a face. Uh, there's a part, another part that's called the intralaminar nucleus in the thalamus. If you remove that, people go into a state of coma. But by and large, uh, with a lot, of, uh, a lot of different aspects of uh, cortex, uh, a little different, different parts of the brain, uh, it's quite remarkable. Our clinician wants to uh, disagree with me, uh, so. Half clinician, half clinician only. Um, uh, it's or more, future clinician, yes. Uh, it's more a question of the signals up on the screen, but I will say, um, are you familiar with this paper that just came out from Shadlin and colleagues? Uh, uh, so there's there was a long-standing argument about, uh, you know, the necessity of certain regions of LIP. the LIP, uh, sorry? LIP, the lateral interpreter. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, for everyone else, the paper was talking about, uh, you know, the necessity of a specific region and doing a certain kind of cortical computation because, uh, you know, there's a big debate in the literature about whether or not this uh, region was necessary for doing something specific. And for a long time, it seemed that it wasn't actually necessary. But what these people actually demonstrated is that, you know, when you look at the acute period of time after you inactivate this region, it turns out that it is necessary. So my question is, first question, do you have any thoughts about what the regions of the brain are where, you know, the... That I, the, the, the fact that I just uh, articulated. Uh, I, I don't like the notion that you can go into... The, we, I think that all of cortex is precious, all the brain is precious. I, I hate the notion that you can remove part. So one possibility, as I said, is, is recovery. That, that there is, uh, uh, you know, you remove this part, there's a major cognitive uh, effect. Uh, but within a couple of hours, uh, things recover. Recovery is a real thing. Uh, 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 there are many cases of patients that have stroke, and they are basically in a state of coma, and then a day or two later, they, they, they recover. So, so recovery is, is, is an option. So some other area takes over. In, in, it, this has not been tested very rigorously in, this, in, in these patients, but, but basically they, they, they do surgery, and then a day later, they, they, they seem fine. They seem fine. It's not a very scientific argument. I, I suspect that we haven't done the right behavioral experiments. And if we really probe with the right behavioral experiments, we will find that indeed what I just said is not true and that there will be a cognitive deficit. However, if you just look at this patient, if you ask any clinician and, and, and they, they will say, these people are, are just fine. So, so yes, it could be that they, there's a recovery. There, there are other areas that, are, that take over. For example, you remove the hippocampus on both sides there's a major deficit in terms of forming long-term uh, memories. Uh, you remove it on one side, you still have the hippocampus on the other side, uh, and, and presumably that, that's helping and, 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 and taking on. So, so, so you're right. I, I don't, I don't want to... Um, I, I just want to comment on this as a, as a tangent. Uh, I, I suspect that what I said is wrong, 
uh, I think it's consistent with all the literature or most of the literature uh, so far. Uh, but I hope that you and, and many others will, will actually show really when you do better behavioral tests and at the right time uh, that, that there are real deficits. That there, there are, I, I find it hard to believe that there are parts of brain that are completely useless. Uh, um, but who knows? Right, exactly. It makes us, you know, question what exactly we're studying. If, there there you know, are you parts can scoop of our, the entire there, thing out and suddenly. Uh, there, there are, uh, absolutely. I, I do have to say that there are, there's a lot of biology that's completely useless, right? So our DNA is full of junk. Uh, that, that's, there, there are millions of events of viruses that are we are integrated. Uh, um, there's the appendix. There, there are parts of brain that, that are there probably for uh, historic evolutionary. So it's not impossible that, that there would be parts of our brain that, that, that really do nothing. Uh, so, but, but, but I, I don't like that. Okay. But anyway, time will tell. Yes. So I'm working a lot with fMRI, and people often like compare brain patterns of different people. Um, but if you now say I can remove large chunks of the brain without actually having cognitive impairments, what is your um, thought about actually studying cognition with like these macro scale patterns? Okay, I, I, I've said it before. Uh, I don't believe in fMRI. Uh, period. Uh, I, 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 I'm happy to expand on that and, and, and have a, a lovely discussion. But, but even with neurophysiology, uh, I, I think even, even with real neuroscientific data, you can record data and potentially remove that and, and nothing happens. In fact, this, this story that, that, that we were just discussing, there, there are many nature papers about the role of the, an area called LIP, lateral interparietal nucleus, in decision making. And then people came and showed that you remove this area and, and monkeys can do uh, all of the same tasks in, in exactly the same way. And, and then this led to a very long uh, discussion uh, with, with Mike Shadlin recently saying, oh, but that's because you, there's recovery uh, uh, after that, right? But even with, with real neurophysiological data, we may record the activity of neurons. Uh, we may find interesting correlates. In fact, most of neuroscience are correlates. Uh, you know, you show a picture, you record something, you show an auditory stimulus. Uh, these are these are correlates. They don't necessarily imply causality. And and I think it's a humbling thought that uh, that if we remove that part, uh, uh, it, it's not obvious that, that there would be a, a, a behavioral uh, deficit. So uh, I, I think it's very important to pay attention to uh, not only to look at correlations, which is what most people do in the field, but also uh, to study uh, causation. Co is doing a very nice uh, causal experiment as well. So if you uh, talk to Co, he has also a lot to say about this. I mean by recovery here, as in, uh, that's, you know, you have memory somewhere and then you record how the, the missing parts, like how, how the wire, how the part is wired before and you just reproduce that or you have to still have to be trained on certain tasks and then you recover from those. So, so this is a common observation in, 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 in the clinic that a lot of people uh, recover. My, my, my grandfather at some point had a stroke. Uh, and he was uh, completely aphasic in, in half of his face. Uh, and, and, and we were very sad. And, and then three weeks later, he, he was just fine. So he could he recovered function uh, uh, completely. Uh, I don't know exactly what happened. I think people don't know exactly. But, but there, there are many cases of people who have a car accident and they're in a state of coma. And then a few days later, uh, they, they, they emerge uh, fine. Not, not always, right? But there, there are many cases of, 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 uh, of situations where, uh, where, where there's recovery. One possibility is that there's another part of the brain that, that, that takes over. Some of that may be through, through learning and training. Some people need uh, physical therapy and, and, and retraining and so on. Some of that is, is, is uh, just, um, uh, it seems to be automatic recovery. I, I don't think we understand well exactly what, what happens during, uh, during, during recovery. Uh, there's a lot of redundancy, uh, arguably, uh, uh, starting with the fact that we have two hemispheres. So there's, there's probably a lot of redundancy that, 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 that's important and, 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 and perhaps built in through evolution uh, to, to, to deal with these cases uh, where there could be damage uh, to, to, to the brain. Um, it was just on the notion of uh, compensation, because I understand that that's, that's an excuse or it's a reason. Um, that people use to explain changes in brain activity after a lesion, as in you notice that another part of the brain is more active than it was before. But what goes to say that that's compensation? Compensation is a very active process. It implies that it is there to serve a function to recover the lost function from another part of the brain, rather than just redistribution of activity. 
I, I, I confess I know almost nothing about what really happens during the during recovery. So, so you're, you're absolutely right. So uh, I, I don't know if it, there's an, another area that, that, that takes over in these cases. I don't know if there's a recovery of the tissue. There, there are lots of interesting possibilities. And, 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 and in general, I'm not even sure what, how much is known about uh, It's not. So my question isn't about the biological basis of compensation. It's about how we can, even in the first place, say that this is compensation from a, like a sort of a logical perspective. Uh, just because we see more activity after a lesion in another brain region, what makes you say that's actually compensating? I, I'm saying something much more basic. I'm saying that there's a person that has a deficit, and, and, and then after a certain amount of time, the, the person does not have that deficit. Uh, I'm, not saying anything, I'm not saying anything about the mechanism of how that works. I'm saying there's, there's the observation that, uh, that, that there are many cases where uh, people have a, a major behavioral deficit, and, 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 and they, they seem to behaviorally recover uh, uh, from that. And, and we can discuss what, what, what's really happening inside the brain. Yeah. Um, I was just curious about what kind of uh, techniques you would use in humans to study the causal, causal relationships. Do you want to in response? I, I think in humans it's very hard. I'm, I'm a, uh, I, I think um, for the foreseeable future we will have to, if you really want to understand brain function, uh, we need to understand non-human animals. Uh, uh, I, I think that it's still the case. I'm going to show some human data if, if, if I can go to the next slide. But but, uh, but 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 mostly, I think that it's very hard to do causal intervention. There are some people who have to try to do it from the from the outside. Uh, I, I think that that's that's very hard to interpret those uh, those those results. Uh, lesion experiments, I think, are interesting, but they're, they're very, very hard to interpret. Uh, lesions, uh, of course, don't respect anatomical boundaries. They don't care about our scientific questions. So, so there's a lot of, uh, in fact, in many cases, I would say we, we, we start in neuroscience with lesions. So the discovery of primary visual cortex was due to, to lesions, to bullets uh, going through, uh, uh, through the brain uh, in, in soldiers uh, during the First World War. Uh, the discovery of the hippocampus as a fundamental uh, unit, uh, area for, for memory uh, came from these bilateral excisions of the, uh, of the hippocampus during in, in epilepsy patients. Uh, Broca's area in language. Is, uh, so the, we, I think we can learn a lot to get started uh, from, from, from lesions, but, but that's not a, it, it's hard to make a systematic program of, of, of neuroscience research just based on accidents and, and and, and, and so on. So I, I think it's very hard to study causality in, 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 in human neuroscience. And what about microstimulation in open brain surgeries? Indeed. And, and I, th I think that that's quite fascinating. I, I, I think uh, the, 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 the literature on, on stimulation in humans is, is, is uh, very, very sparse and, and very hard to interpret. Uh, most people don't have any controls. Uh, uh, I, I think those experiments are, are, are really a mess. They, they're, they're interesting. So, so in these patients, you can also stimulate through these electrodes. Usually it's very few trials, uh, uh, all the problems that Jeff was mentioning about science, about people have an idea and they go and try to confirm that idea. All, all of those caveats apply, I think, uh, uh, especially to these kinds of I think that's interesting. It's, uh, uh, mostly, you basically, you can disrupt things. You can stimulate and disrupt things. And, and, uh, but, but in general, I think this is, uh, these experiments are very hard to do. Sorry, a very quick plug for the plasticity of the brain, and then please go on to the next slide. But uh, one thing, I think this is sort of in response to what Vish was asking earlier about passive versus active and, you know, how you can make those distinctions. One thing that they do now with uh, patients who have been in uh, very severe accidents and they have severance of peripheral nerves is they will chop a, uh, a healthy nerve, a nerve that still innervates its target muscle. This is in the periphery, but, you know. CNS is involved. They chop the peripheral nerve that's uh, innervating the intact muscle. They reflect it over. They basically suture it onto the open nerve head from the other nerve that is damaged, and they just let it sit there, and eventually the axons regrow. So the example that I've, I've seen done in the operating room is, uh, you know, that you take a cranial nerve and you reflect it over and you suture it onto a peripheral nerve. And after many, many months, the patient will learn to, uh, you know, use the, the part of uh, the brain that was... Uh, previously controlling like the sternocleidomastoid and, you know, the trapezius muscle to control their arm. It's not great. It's not perfect, but you can forcibly with PT repurpose those cortical circuits to do something completely different in terms of motor kinematics and in terms of goals and targets in the environment. So the, the upper bound on where humans can retrain at least motor parts of their cortex to do other things is, is quite staggering. It's quite astounding. Uh, th that, that's very cool. Thank you. Uh, th that's, that's very interesting. So that, that, that's a much better answer than... Uh, so if you have serious questions... Uh, 
Okay, uh, let, let me actually show you a little bit of that uh, uh, here. So um, this is what happens in the human brain. This is somewhat analogous to some of the recordings in monkeys when you show pictures. So this is a, a human patient that has an electrode in the inferior temporal cortex, the same areas that, that are important for visual object recognition in, 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 in monkeys. This is an intracranial field potential as a function of time. This is 150 milliseconds. This is time zero. Uh, you present a picture and you see a deflection in voltage. This is quite strong. You can see it in every single trial. Each row here is, is, is one trial. This is the presentation of the whole images. Uh, and, and, and this is time. And the color here indicates voltage. Here are the units in microvolts of the voltage signal that, 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 that we can record. Uh, and, and, and you don't need to do uh, fancy statistics. Uh, a friend of mine always says statistics is the art of torturing data. There are no statistics here. This is, uh, uh, you, you know, this is the art of torturing data until they confess. That's the, that's the, that's, that's a phrase. Uh, anyway, so here you can see that uh, uh, basically for for all of these different images in every single trial, you can get these very reliable, uh, uh, visually responsive and selective uh, signals. I'm going to very quickly flash this that we did a long time ago because uh, uh, a lot of people often ask me about it. Uh, so uh, this is a, a case where we're recording single neuron activity, not local field potentials. So this is a, a standard way of showing single neuron activity. This is a raster plot. Each one of these little marks here corresponds to a single action potential from a neuron. In this particular case, this is a neuron in the right amygdala. This is a presentation of 15 different pictures. The patient is passively looking at these 15 different uh, uh, pictures that are presented for one second uh, uh, on the screen. Uh, each row corresponds to one trial. Here there are nine repetitions of this rabbit here. And then this is what's called the posthumous time histogram. It's an average of activity in a bin uh, uh, here, 200 milliseconds, aligned to the onset of the picture. This is the onset of the picture. This is the offset of the picture. So you can see that this neuron did not increase its firing rate, did not basically care too much about the presentation of this, uh, of, of this rabbit here. However, uh, when the patient was looking at these different pictures of uh, Bill Clinton, uh, there was a pretty substantial increase in, in, in activity. And, and this, this was quite exciting, A, because it demonstrated the degree of selectivity of these uh, neurons, but also the degree of invariance and tolerance. These pictures are very different from, uh, from each other, and yet the neuron was uh, uh, able to uh, select those. These neurons are not just responding to, to any phase or to any, uh, or to any male phase uh, or to any precedent. Uh, they're doing something which we don't understand quite well, but uh, it's, it's quite selective and, and quite invariant to different transformations. One of the many caveats of this type of experiments is that there, we, we only have a short amount of time to present uh, in, uh, pictures. So there, there's always a, a plethora of questions that I, that I get asked and the answer to most of those questions is I don't know. So I will preempt many of these questions by saying, I don't know whether this neuron would also respond to the White House, whether the neuron also responds to Monica Lewinsky, whether the neuron also responds to uh, Bill Clinton's uh, uh, voice, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There, there, are, there are many other questions that, that, that one can ask of, about these responses, and, and, and we just uh, didn't, uh, didn't test that. The only point I want to make from the previous slide on this one is that we can get a uh, very high signal to noise ratio, uh, uh, millisecond dynamics, uh, and, and, and high resolution in uh, uh, finding visually selective responses uh, in, the, in, in, in the brain. So then finally, to Spandan's question, uh, so we did a, the bubbles experiment with occluded objects while showing these images uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the patients. Here's the data that I showed you before. This is what happens when you show the whole image with 100% visibility. And these are individual trials of uh, presentation of these uh, heavily occluded uh, uh, images. So here you have uh, about 10-15% uh, visibility. And yet despite that, uh, we see that we can still see, even in the individual trials, uh, the, uh, a deflection in voltage that's uh, arguably representing that, uh, that image that was shown on the, on the screen. There's a significant amount of variability. If you look at the details of these uh, voltage waveforms, they're quite different from one, uh, from, from one to the other. Uh, there's some heterogeneity in here as well. So even if you present the same picture, there's some heterogeneity. So these are different pictures, so it's perhaps to be expected that there's some variation. But despite this, that variation, there is a visually evoked signal and a selective signal in all of these cases, despite uh, heavy, heavy occlusion. Interestingly, if you look at the timing of these responses, so this is the uh, um, uh, actually the trough of this uh, uh, of this voltage signal happens here at 150 milliseconds, whereas in all of these cases the signals uh, uh, seem to be delayed. That is, there seems to be a, a slight shift uh, in activity. So here, the trough of this voltage signal. Is at 190 milliseconds, 190, 290, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
So I argued at the behavioral level that it costs about 50 milliseconds to do pattern completion. And, and I would argue that uh, it also costs on the order of 50 milliseconds or so to do pattern completion at the physiological level. That is that there's a reflection of the, uh, this increased computational uh, resources that are needed for pattern completion also in these uh, physiological signals uh, in, inside the brain. Okay, so just to circle back to uh, a question that I suspect we will discuss uh, many times and, and, and Jeff also mentioned uh, yesterday. Okay, so we have some behavioral observations, we have some physiological observations. Ultimately, what does it mean to understand pattern completion or any other phenomenon? What does it mean to really understand how something works? So I would contend, and, and, and maybe Jeff might, might, might disagree with me, that ultimately understanding means uh, having a theory, uh, that the language of understanding should be mathematics, and that, should, that theory should be instantiated in computational models. So computational models, uh, in some sense, as, as a famous statistician once said, uh, all models are wrong, some are useful. So the notion of building models is to try to provide possible hypotheses and possible ways of thinking about uh, how those uh, computations uh, 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 take place and what are the possible circuits and, and, and mechanisms. So I think ultimately uh, it's fine to have ideas and to discuss uh, ideas about behavior, about physiology, but if we really want to understand, we need to actually quantify our understanding uh, by actually very clearly stating our assumptions and building computational models. So let me give you a flavor of uh, uh, computational models for, uh, for, for pattern completion. So first of all, this is the basic, the, the same format that I showed you before. And here I'm showing you uh, a lot of uh, bottom-up uh, 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 computational models for visual object uh, uh, recognition. Uh, this was done in 2018. Computer vision moved so fast that, that uh, for the uh, youth in the audience, uh, some of these names may be outdated. You may not even know what these are. These, these are models that won uh, computer vision competitions uh, in, 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 in classifying uh, uh, image net images. Uh, uh, if, if you're, um, so some of you may remember AlexNet, VGG, ResNet, Inception. We, we tested a, a lot of different models. The short answer is these models can do uh, uh, object recognition, but they're still quite below uh, human performance in this uh, very simple task of recognizing uh, heavily occluded objects. Yes. So you mean here is average over all uh, length of presenting the image or? 25 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds, 150 milliseconds. For, for the models? No, no. For, humans, there's oh, compared to models. This is which which trace from humans. This is a certain presentation time or an average of all of them? Uh, so, so this is without backward masking. So th th there was oh, less so variation without backward masking in, 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 in human uh, uh, performance uh, across different... I think this is the average of all the... No, you could look like the bars a little bigger. That's why I thought it's another average. Bigger than the previous one? Okay, I, I can, we can go back and, and, and check. I, I, I think um, the, the, without backward masking, the, there was variation due to timing, but the, but the big effects of the, the, the presentation time were with, with backward masking. So this is without the backward masking. Does it mean it's uh, not exactly fair if the models are just trained in classification on like full images without any kind of uh, occluded or blurred parts? So here, here the models are never trained with the occluded uh, objects. They, th these are models that are trained on ImageNet. Uh, in some sense, so, so just, just uh, humans were never really trained with these particular occluded images either. You can always argue uh, that humans have uh, decades of experience with the world and with occlusion. And, and in that sense, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I think it's very f difficult to make real fair comparisons between humans and machines. Uh, there's no I mean way right now that we can mimic uh, two decades of it. You can always say, oh, but, but humans know how to play with toys, or new, humans uh, knew how to eat, and knew how to, there, there are lots of things that humans uh, uh, do. But in terms of these particular images, the humans were never exposed to occluded or trained or given any feedback uh, either. Okay? But, but you're right, this is all uh, with a pre-trained model that, that, that was never trained with uh, object occlusion. If you train with object occlusion, all of these models do extremely well. Uh, if, if you actually train uh, with, uh, with, the, with the occluded images. I see. So um, if like the models were trained by the uh, pattern completion tasks, you think they would like also perform similarly well? As the, I, th I think the devil's in the details. So what do you mean by train the pattern completion tasks? If you train with uh, heavily occluded images, they, they learn to recognize those. 
I, I call that memorization. I don't think that this, this is really pattern completion. Uh, we, we can debate about the terminology here, but 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 this is this is uh, uh, what we really would like to show, and, and I'll, I'll show a glimpse of that. Is models that can really extrapolate from uh, seeing uh, full objects and recognize objects that are occluded without having to train on those occluded images. If you every time I, I, I have a new transformation like blurring or noise or or occlusion, if I have to retrain my models, I, I would say that's that's not a good model. Gotcha. So it's more like a question of general. Uh, it's, it's about generalization. Yes. Gotcha. Uh, so one question related to Lance's question. Uh, so I thought all these models have this data augmentation as the you know when when, when they are ha taking the input. So would that matter? Have you checked what what type of uh, data augmentation have this model been? Um, I, I think all of these are, are, are trained with uh, cases where uh, the, the, the images uh, may be uh, rotated or cropped, but not occlusion. Uh, so I, I think all the data augmentation that goes into training these models do not include any, any, any type of occlusion. OK. Uh, one more question. Can you please go back to two slides? Um, yeah, yeah, so this, yeah I, I'm having a question. How, how do I draw the conclusion that it costs around 50 milliseconds from this figure? The, the 50 is, uh, I, I think it's hard to, uh, the 50 is the average of, this is a single electrode. I'm, I'm doing a, a handful of trials from, from, from a single electrode. The, the number 50 uh, comes from uh, 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 hundreds of electrodes that we studied in, in, in this way. Here, what you, can, what, you, what you can see is that in this case, it's 190 minus 150, so that's 40. So this is 40. This is 140. This is 60. Uh, this is some, uh, an experiment I didn't uh, expand on. This is also 60 milliseconds. So the average of all of these, I, I don't know what it is, but but this, the, the 50 actually is it's just an approximation based on many other electrodes. I'm just giving you a sense that, that things are delayed at the physiological level with this. Thanks. Additional processing. These 50 milliseconds are only in IT or somewhere else. I, I mean, you are aggregating like electrodes everywhere, or just in IT? I'm aggregating in a lot of different uh, places. So, so we had lectures in different parts of the ventral visual cortex, uh, and we tried for uh, quite some time to see if there are differences, and we probably don't have enough data to, to, to really, uh, I suspect that there will be differences in different places. Um, there are other people that have recorded data in, in, in macaque, in, both in IT as well as in V4 and prefrontal cortex. People see these kind of delays in, in all of these different places. Uh, there, it, it isn't clear whether those delays are, are different in different areas. I suspect they are. In our data, we couldn't find that. Other people could not find that. I suspect that's a question of power. Uh, the, the, the conclusions are, 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 are consistent with, uh, in, uh, across different brain areas in humans as well as uh, uh, within the ventral visual cortex and also in different areas in, in, in monkeys as well. Uh, but we couldn't really see any clear difference between areas uh, in terms of that delay. So this delay includes like electrodes in medial, medial temporal lobe and medial prefrontal cortex, for instance. Yeah. This is not does not include medial prefrontal cortex, mostly uh, ventral visual cortex. Okay. Yes. Um, the performance increase from one, I think, one percent visibility to two or three or whatever the next time step is, is really big uh, for humans, but also the models seem to have their largest increase in performance as well after that sort of what I would think is very small increase in how much of the, the image I can see. Um, with that in mind, do you think there are some shared principles between the human and the models in the way that they're using the information? Yeah, I, 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 I think there are differences. So, so one thing that uh, always uh, troubled me, especially for the models, if you really look at the details of what's happening here, even when there's almost not, of, of course, if, if it's zero, uh, it's a chance that that's that's very different. If you close your eyes, you don't see. Right? So so if, if, if but even when you have one percent of information, uh, the models are slightly above chance, and and that bothers me. And that that speaks to the fact that these models are super powerful. Even with just a couple of pixels, uh, they can be above chance. Not not not, not very impressive, uh, but they can discriminate something. There's something different between the different images. Even we, we try to control uh, as much as possible, no matter what we do, there's always a handful of pixels that contain some information. So that, 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 that's one, one, one example of, of, of something that the models are doing that's, that's, that's kind of peculiar and, and, and humans uh, deteriorate much rapidly in there. Uh, but, but you're right that the models do improve and, 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 and the, the overall shape maybe is similar uh, uh, between, between two. I, I suspect that models and humans are still very, very far apart and I'll, I'll 
I'll, I'll, I'll say much more about differences between models and humans in the, in, in the second part. So, so here we did something very simple, which is we took uh, one of these uh, computational models and we, add, we added uh, recurrent connections uh, to, to, to the model to try to explain the ability to uh, perform pattern completion. Why add recurrent connections? One, because we think that at the behavior level, there is an additional time that's required for pattern completion. Second, because at the physiological level, we think that there is additional time required for pattern completion. Third, because we know from an anatomical uh, standpoint that there are massive horizontal connections, which tend to be somewhat slow and, 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 and that are pervasive throughout the ventral visual cortex. And finally, because we knew that there are models such as a Hopfield attractor models that are very good at pattern completion. So basically what we did here was very simple. We took, um, in this case, AlexNet, we did this also with many other uh, models. So AlexNet is a, by now a relatively simple architecture with, with, with seven layers. And then at the top layer, the FC7 la layer, we added all to all recurrent connections uh, uh, throughout, uh, throughout that layer. We never train those connections with the occluded objects. So this model only sees the full objects. And the weights of this uh, Hopfield network, this all-to-all uh, -all connected uh, uh, um, uh, recurrent network, uh, are such that they're attractors, meaning that they store information about all of the fully visible objects, not about the uh, occluded ones. Okay? Uh, these are uh, symmetric connectivity matrices. That means that the connection from unit one to two is the same uh, strength as the connection from unit two to unit uh, one. And that's what we call here the RNN age. And we can see that without any additional training, uh, without looking at all the uh, occluded objects uh, uh, at all, uh, this model can already improve performance uh, with respect to the uh, purely uh, bottom-up uh, uh, counterpart. It doesn't quite reach human level performance. If we allow ourselves to train that model with the, uh, uh, with, with the occluded images, then uh, we can achieve uh, much better performance and reach uh, human level uh, performance. Uh, but even without any kind of uh, 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 training with occluded images, uh, just adding this, uh, as a proof of principle, just adding these uh, horizontal connections only in one layer of the network already gives us uh, a boost uh, in, in performance. So uh, this is just one example of how we can combine behavioral data and neurophysiological data and, and, and simple ideas uh, from, 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 uh, from computation to build models that are, uh, that are more powerful just by incorporating some uh, basic aspects of the dynamics of uh, processing in, in, in cortex. Okay, so adding attractive recurrent networks uh, uh, in the top layer improves uh, performance. Um, and so this uh, brings us to the, uh, the conjecture and, uh, uh, that, that we put forward in this uh, review article with Thomas Sir. By the way, Thomas is going to come and, and, and give a talk in a, in a week or so that uh, maybe there are, we can think of cortex uh, as functioning in, in, in two basic modes, one, one which is fast, one which is uh, uh, slow. In a fast way, uh, information can propagate in a largely bottom-up uh, uh, way. And when the problems are relatively easy, that can work uh, uh, extremely well. Whereas uh, when uh, the problems are more complicated, for example, in the case of heavy occlusion, we need additional recurring computations. We need some of this uh, additional connectivity to be able to solve uh, some of these uh, problems. Um, as a technical point, I'm going to mention this very quickly, happy to discuss more. It turns out that mathematically, you can take any recurring network and you can unfold it to build a feedforward network that does exactly the same uh, computation. And here we argue that there are advantages uh, to building things with recurrent networks as opposed to purely bottom-up uh, ones, so that this unfolding process uh, or this unfolding trick uh, is probably not what we want to build, not only from uh, a biological perspective, but also from a computational perspective. From a biological perspective, Using recurrent connections allows you to save uh, a lot of space. Uh, we, we have uh, fewer neurons, we have fewer connections. Uh, the size of the brain is probably a huge constraint in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the evolution in, uh, of biological uh, species. So saving uh, how many neurons you have and being able to build smaller circuits that perform the same computation can be uh, uh, quite, uh, quite, quite important. But for those of you who don't care about the biology, even from a computational uh, standpoint, uh, we argue that this recurrent computational mode can offer flexibility in terms of how to route information depending on the demands of the, uh, of the task. If you do unfolding, meaning that you take the recurrent connections and you just build more layers, 
which in some sense you could argue this has been the trend in computer vision, building bigger and bigger uh, models. Uh, in some sense, you're stuck with all these computations. So for every problem, you have to go through all of these uh, uh, different steps. Whereas if you can do the same thing with these recurrent computations, you can decide that there are some problems that can be solved in this purely bottom-up mode and that is very fast, and other problems where you use this computation. So you can decide with the same exact architecture without changing the architecture at all. You can decide between these uh, two computational modes. So it, it provides the flexibility to utilize the resources uh, in a much more efficient way. Uh, uh, so I think this is interesting also from a computational standpoint, independent of all the additional benefits conferred to uh, biology by, by building smaller brains with uh, less connections. But um, how would that work, meaning this decision process? Like I fail to understand why that would work with recurrent connections and not work if that was unrolled. I, I, I think this works as so, so this is mathematical equivalent. Mm -hmm. So this would work equally well. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean the decision process of using one pipeline or the other. Who, who decides? Yeah, who decides uh, yeah, and yeah. why it works in one case and not in the other? Yeah, good, good question. I, I, I don't know. So one, one, one possibility, and this is pure speculation, uh, is that you have this uh, process here, and then at some point, uh, this uh, uh, machinery, let's call it prefrontal cortex, you're you performing a task and say, um, I have enough evidence, my confidence is 99%, uh, I know exactly what that object is, um, I'm just going to uh, provide a response. I'm just going to click this, uh, this, this button uh, here. Or this may say, wait a minute, I'm not quite sure. My confidence is, is very low. Uh, I'm going to wait a little bit more. I'm going to wait 50 milliseconds more uh, until I, I, I press uh, this, this, this button. And therefore, I'm going to allow to use some of this additional information. I think this is probably happening all the time. It's not that you do or do not use this recurring computation. This is happening all the time. But in some cases, there may be advantages to performance task uh, very fast. If you're playing tennis, maybe you don't have enough time to, to do a lot of, uh, uh, you know. And, and, and similarly, in, the, in this task, uh, if you can do it faster, people will respond uh, faster. So where exactly, who decides which uh, kind of information, whether to wait or not, I, 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 don't, I don't really know. I suspect it's not part of the visual system. I suspect this is uh, past the visual system. Uh, that's why I call it prefrontal cortex. But again, this, this is a, a conjecture. Right? I, don't, I, I don't really know. So what then, in response to that, so of course the decision could be, well, the network could train on that decision between two pathways, but the fact that you actually achieved uh, improved performance without training on nucleated images means that the decision could also have occurred at the end, meaning these two competitions could have happened in parallel and some kind of a common filter at, at the end of the, of the pathways could decide for the nuclear objects to prefer the pattern completion because you get less variance in the result, meaning even if you don't gain the uh, performance, I mean, in terms of efficiency of choosing one faster over slower in different cases, in terms of accuracy performance, uh, which you get immediately just by adding pattern completion without um, uh, added training means that at least at this level, the network could decide that which one has, let's say, less variance and is more accurate and, and do this at the end. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I, I do suspect that the decisions come, happen at the end. This, this is just a schematic, right? It's not fast or slow. It's a continuum, uh, and, and, and de de depending on the task. I suspect this is happening all the time. It's not that the horizontal connections are shut down for, for one time. But, but it's a question of uh, what, what you actually need to do with that information. And, and, and depending on the task, depending on the circumstances, uh, uh, the, the brain may decide to you know, sometimes you, you you want to act fast, and and sometimes you may want to ruminate more on 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 on, on, on the information. And and again, it's it's not black and white. It's I suspect both things are happening at the same time. And for different tasks, you have sort of a continuum of reaction uh, uh, times. Uh, Just a quick one. Um, well, this unfolding time trick, let's call it. It's actually makes the networks, the neural networks, um, artificial, trainable. Well, the recurrent ones without the unfolding, it's really unobvious, like mathematically, what to do with this. So, any thoughts? So, so it makes, uh, so it makes yeah. the recurrent networks? Yeah, we have this back propagation mechanism yes. for the artificial neural networks, which makes it easy to train fit for networks. And then we, the recurrent ones, we unfold them in time, we make it a fit forward, and yes. then, yeah. And with the real recurrency, well, I don't really have a clue how to learn this 
things like artificially. Yeah, so, so it, it's harder to train recurrent networks. Uh, uh, a lot of the back propagation algorithms, are, so when, when people train recurrent networks in general, what they do is they unfold and then they, and, and, and they, they train. Yes, absolutely. Um, Tommy already mentioned briefly, uh, I, I think a lot of us believe that back propagation exactly as defined is not what's happening in the brain. Georgia here recently had a paper about uh, one potential alternative to back propagation. There, there are many biologically possible uh, uh, or more biologically possible alternatives to back propagation. I think a lot of the competition happens, a lot of the learning happens uh, locally. So in general, uh, m my guess is that the strict definition of back propagation as, as usually defined with a global signal that, that, that sort of feeds back uh, uh, everywhere in, uh, um, through gradient descent, I, I think that's an unlikely way in which uh, br br brains, uh, br brains learn. Uh, um, and, and I think that, that partly addresses why with recurrent networks, we, we, we don't need to worry about the fact that back propagation basically is, is, is strong. I think the question is like more what to do with the recurrent networks, not like why back propagation is probably not the solution. So if there is like way to learn them better or at all, so, so way, way to run them, yes. So the question, I guess, is how to train them. Uh, but, but, but in terms of what to do, I, uh, I, um, I, 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 in, the, in, the, in the brain, at least, there is massive recurrency everywhere, basically, both horizontal connections as well as top-down connections. Uh, I, I think that those uh, can be very, very powerful for, for a lot of tasks. I was planning to discuss uh, a few other examples. Maybe I would have to skip them, and I'm happy uh, to, to talk uh, uh, more. Uh, but I... I, I think it's unlikely that the answer uh, to, to to most computations uh, will be uh, will 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 not need uh, uh, forms of uh, recurrent and top down uh, incorporating these uh, types of uh, connectivity. Uh, I think that that's going to be more and more prominent for for, for many different things. This, no, I, I just have a couple of examples of that. Um, okay. Um, I'm gonna just uh, skip, uh, I think, uh, because I, I have a, a whole second part which I, which was more speculative and, and I think fun for, uh, for, for general uh, discussion. So I think I'm gonna skip these uh, two other examples uh, completely. Uh, I'm just gonna mention what they are and if uh, anybody's interested, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk more about them. So the second theme that I was gonna uh, discuss is uh, eye movement. So after this uh, 150, 200 milliseconds, Basically, we move our eyes uh, all the time. Uh, we we constantly are we're constantly moving our eyes. Uh, that's that's crucial to to understand scenes, to understand uh, our objects. And and Meng Mi here, together with several other uh, people, have been building computational models to try to uh, better understand uh, uh, how we move our eyes, uh, where we move our eyes to in the context of uh, visual search. So there's a, a series of uh, uh, experiments uh, and, and and computational models. Uh, to do a um, zero-shot uh, uh, visual search uh, uh, that, that's invariant and can search for objects in, in, in scenes. We compare that with psychophysics. Uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, skip uh, uh, all of that. If, uh, happy, happy to talk more, uh, uh, or you can also talk to uh, Meng Mi about this. So, so the second thing that I will skip, and just to give you the, 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 the title and a glimpse of this, um, we have become quite interested in how can we understand uh, a visual scene, not just an, uh, identify and label uh, a particular object, but understand the relationships between objects, understand what's happening in the scene, understanding the, 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 the gist of the image, uh, uh, and, and answering a, a plethora of questions that transcend the ability to, to just say uh, by way object categorization or, or this is an object or not. So uh, part of this was motivated by some of the challenges in, in our uh, eye movement visual search uh, algorithms, but also in general by the notion that we can recognize objects uh, quite well when they are uh, with, the, with the right uh, context. And maybe I will do a very short demo uh, of this, I think, because I think it illustrates the point better than me talking. Uh, if you have not seen this before, if you have seen this before, please shut up. If you have not seen this before, uh, let me know if you can figure out what this is. Uh, it's pretty hard, I think. So, any any guess? It's not your glasses. It's not a problem with the glasses. And you can adjust them all you want. It's it's very hard. It's very hard to do uh, to to recognize what this object is. But then when you show uh, an entire image, uh, then then it becomes uh, I would say trivial. 
this is not because you make eye movements. This is not because you have a, you need a lot of reasoning and and and, and a lot of uh, processing time. Uh, this is just because all of this contextual information uh, can be uh, can can make uh, sort of a, a major uh, change in your ability to interpret. Uh, what's going on here. So, so you can do experiments where you control uh, uh, fixation. You know that the information that you're seeing in the phobia is exactly the same under the two conditions. But everything around uh, the entire scene uh, can make a dramatic difference in terms of whether you understand what objects are or not. So again, we did a lot of uh, uh, experiments and present a, a series of um, uh, basic computational models uh, to begin to try to understand scenes and how we can go from objects uh, into uh, uh, into understanding uh, scenes. And uh, again, I, I won't have time to, uh, again, Meng Mi was involved in this, uh, Spandan uh, was also involved in, 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 in this work. I, I, I won't have time to, to do justice to this. I just want to put the titles in case anybody wants to uh, discuss this uh, more. Uh, and so I'll, I'll skip this. Uh, we'll take uh, uh, maybe a 10 minute break. And then uh, the, the second part will be mostly about uh, uh, trying to make uh, provocative statements, uh, a couple of uh, conjectures, uh, and, and again, mostly to open it up for, for discussion about uh, the differences between uh, uh, machines and, 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 and biological intelligence. Okay, so let's uh, take a 10-minute break. <laughs> 